what's the best piece of advice or insight you've ever gotten about screenwriting from an outside source, from a person? Um, I don't think I ever have gotten good screenwriting advice. Stick with it, kid. <laughs> That's my advice to you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I think the, the best advice in a way was from Marquez, you know, to, to keep it truthful. Right. You know, no matter how fantastic it is, you know, that everything, no matter how crazy and insane, has to have an element of truth and reality to it. You know, because the phrase is magic realism. You right. know, it's not magic surrealism, it's magic realism. Right. So in any kind of magic realist story, the realism has to be absolute. You know, it has to be about people who get up in the morning, who eat, their foods and have jobs or whatever. You know, part of the problem in, in American filmmaking sometimes with magic realism is that it confuses the word magic as if it were magic tricks. But they're not magic tricks. They're the kinds of things that could really happen. And then the key is, it's a little bit like the storm scene in King Lear. King Lear's going crazy, right? He's walking through the countryside and there's a storm. Well, the storm is just a metaphor for the raging... A manifestation. Yeah, of his insanity inside. And that, to me, that's like the, one of the clearest uh, examples of magic realism, where whatever it is that's magical is a direct reflection of the psychological state of the characters at that time. So like in this little story, the boy needed, needed this. You right. know, he needed this cat to be there, so it, at night it becomes real. So there's got to be an element of truth to... Yeah, and, and emotional necessity. There has to be an, an emotional necessity for the magic to occur, or else it's random, mm -hmm. you know, or, or arbitrary. And the last thing magic should be is arbitrary. Well, I'm staying on the truth tip for a second. Um, what's your most appalling industry experience? <laughs> um, and you, you the can... jeweler's up there. <laughs> um, I recently had an experience where, for, my, for Celestina, uh, we're casting Antonio Banderas as the male lead. The female lead is an unknown actress who embodies, in my mind, all the qualities this character should have. We met with some financiers, and uh, we were sitting around lunch, and one of the financiers, who I'd never met before, who really wasn't actually one of the financiers, but was a friend of one of the financiers who came to lunch, but he had read the screenplay and said, you know, it's the best screenplay he's read in five years, and he really wanted to become part of it, uh, kept saying, who is this girl you have? Who is this like incredible beauty, this magical girl? Who could she be? You know, who could be? And she's sitting right next to me. And he goes on and on and on, and it's Ouch. really scary. And finally, we say, "Well, you, you've just met her. She's right here." And he completely is quiet. He doesn't say a word. Lunch ends, and everyone's getting up to go. And he practically crawls across the table to pinhole me and say, "Look." Are you really locked into this girl? It's, I've got somebody who's so good that if we, made, if we got her, we can make the movie tomorrow. And I just found that appalling. It's like it's completely lacking in respect for her, for my choice in her. And, you know, so that, that's a small okay. example. Have you found uh, that you've ever, on, in that respect, lost control of a screenplay um, in your experience and have it be taken away from you or, pu or put through different paces or have choices made on it that you wouldn't make? in your experience, or have you been lucky on that side of things so far? Yeah, I mean, I think that's unavoidable, mm -hmm. you know, and even in the Motorcycle Diaries, you know, there were choices imposed that... Um, were there business choices or financial partly, choices? Partly, you know, like the choice of, of cutting one of the two boat scenes, for instance, was a budgetary choice, and also had to deal with schedule and how, you know, all that kinds of things. Um, no, there's, there's always that kind of stuff, and, you know, what you want to do if you're lucky, and I've been lucky, is is to work with a collaborator whose choices you respect and whose aesthetic you know, blends into yours. And so Walter and I really have a very similar worldview and, and uh, we, we, we treat film with the same degree of respect. So uh, collaborating with him is not a problem, even though he may say, you know, I really want this scene to be this and not that, or he'll question a choice of mine. I, I tend to find that his questions come from a very good place in terms of what is the best piece of storytelling, you know, as opposed to, I'm the director, I've got the, the power and you don't. In terms of storytelling, um, when you're writing such character-based stories, um, do you kind of employ the, use, the uses of tent poles to kind of hold up your structure the way you would in a traditional screenplay, or do you find that you're, you're writing from more character-based um, side of things where you're not as rigid with structure? Structure is unavoidable. I mean, you really have to pay attention. To me, a film is a, a vehicle for emotion. You know, you go to a movie to be moved or to be excited or to be scared or, you know, or to fall in love or whatever those things are. 
And you know, the root of feeling is character, and I think all, almost everything I write is character-based. You know, with, the, with Motorcycle Diaries, you know, it was what is it to be a 20-year-old medical student loose in the world for the first time? What do you do with yourself? Mm -hmm. What do you think? You know, what are your passions? So to me, those are the questions. You know? So the character led into the structure. Yeah, yeah. And in the Welcome to America, for instance, to me, I really understood the value of the story when I began to think of it as a story of survival. You know, it's horrendous that, that these girls are sex slaves, and, and there's no debate about that. There's no question. But the question is, how do you survive immorally? Like, how do you survive spiritually? And so the story really is about the two girls who are in the story. One does not survive, but one does. And what is it, why does she, not the other? And to me, that's, that's fascinating, you know? And the State Boys Rebellion, you know, what is it about that kid, Freddie, that makes it possible for him to survive, you know, the sexual abuse and everything else? Uh, and that's all character. Uh -huh. In terms of kind of when you got into screenwriting and, and when Motorcycle Diaries eventually happened, um, sometimes you hear about certain types of ages and practice in Hollywood in terms of like always going for like 20 something screenwriters or 20 something anything. Like, do you, do, have you ever encountered any of that or is that kind of a myth? I, I think in my particular situation, it hasn't been the case. Uh, only one time that I remember being in a meeting uh, and I was 40 then where the executive made some kind of comment that I interpreted it as ages. And I wish I could remember what it was. But my, my thought was, she wants a younger writer. Right. Um, for whatever reason. And I think they did hire a younger writer and they were sorry. <laughs> um, but no, honestly, since I turned 40, I've worked hard more than ever. You know, it hasn't really been a problem. And um, you'd mentioned previously that you don't really read other screenplays uh, that kind of float around town or that you, know, that's, you read that sell to studios and, and whatnot. Do you follow the business side of things much or kind of ignore all that? No, I don't. I don't, I don't care, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, Do you I think it would be a detriment if you did follow it? Well, I, I, it would just take time mm -hmm. that I don't have. You know, and I don't know what I will do with the information, except I might be better at a dinner party or something like that. But I, I don't particularly, I don't care about who's doing what and where. I honestly don't. In terms of Welcome to America, are you finding that the, the dailies you're seeing as, as the film is being shot, it's, it's, it's staying fairly close to your screenplay? From what I've seen, yeah, from what I've seen, though uh, I've read a few reports about the movie that like bring up characters I don't think I remember writing. Uh, reports like uh, that. In, the, in, the in the trades okay. or, you know, um, and, and I wonder where, where is that coming from? It, it's interesting, I mean, with the, with the Motorcycle Diaries, it's, it's a blessing that that was my first film because Walter was such a great collaborator and I really felt completely invested in the process. With Welcome to America, it's the, really the opposite. I really feel more like a, a gun for hire. How did that come about? Like, what was the, the origins of that? That was, uh, well, Roland Emmerich you know, came to me. With the article? With the article and said, you know, gave me the article and he had, he had put together like a 10 page outline himself. And as I said earlier, he's a master at spinning stories. Mm -hmm. he, could, he could do this in a second, you know, much better. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he had a really fascinating story to tell and I really was hooked in by it. And, and I have to say, you know, Roland for whatever people might think about his films or his choices, you know, has really decided to put his money into, you know, four very interesting low budget films of which Welcome to America is one of them. And, you know, he doesn't have to do that. And I really respect that, that he wants to do that. You know, originally he was going to direct it, but then he stepped out and he gave the job to a, a relatively unknown 28 year old director from Germany who's turned out to be quite good, as it turns out. Is that a project that uh, you're sharing credit on with other writers or? Um, God knows what the ultimate thing will be. I think I'm sharing story by credit with Peter Landisman, who wrote the original article, and, and Roland, who wrote, uh, you know, wrote the first story, and then I rewrote Roland's story. Do you have any special methods for writing for female characters? Obviously, this, this screenplay must, you know, must mostly be about women. Did you have, have any special methods about capturing that flavor or getting an ear for that kind of dialogue? Not really, you know. Um, a lot of my plays are about women. Do you have women in your life that read your work? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I also have a wonderful writing group uh, that meets at my house and we read work to each other. Oh, can you elaborate on that? What, what exactly is a writing group? 
Well, we, it's, I had one earlier that I wasn't very happy with, and I disbanded that when I started this one like two years ago. Um, generally, we meet uh, twice a month, and the f first Tuesday of every month we meet at my house, and people bring in you know, whatever they're working on. It could be 10 pages of a screenplay, 10 pages of a novel or a play, whatever. There's no limit to what people bring in. And, we, and the writers read their work, and we sit around and critique it. You know, we talk about it. And then, this, then two weeks later, we meet again to read one full-length piece by one of the members. And so that night is devoted to one person and, and just their work and full-length work. And uh, it's been really great. I Do mean, you find that that's helpful and therapeutic? And oh, very, yeah, yeah. It's really nice to be in a community where people are trying to do serious work, where you know, I feel that the, the level of discourse is pretty high, you know, they're pretty smart you know, uh, looking at each other's work. So yeah, it's, it's good. And, it, and we never talk about business. You know, it's always about, this is my writing problem. You know, Joe in Act Two is too inactive or whatever that is. You know, let's talk about it, let's solve it together. And it's remarkably, so far, um, you know, not a lot of ego involved. People are very, very open to each other's suggestions. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, now with uh, On the Road, why do you think it's been gestating so long or in development for so long? Wasn't Francis Ford Coppola the original director? Uh, I think so, yeah. I mean, he's had it 20 plus years. 20 plus years, and he's staying on as a producer? He's staying on as a producer. He, he is not directing it. Walter will direct it, which may be the thing that finally gets it going, because Walter's so good. What do you think has held it up, kind of? I don't know. You know, when, when I was hired to write it, uh, one of the first things that, that happened is that Walter sent me the previous seven drafts. Or set, not, they're not even seven drafts. They're seven separate screenplays. Um, written by different writers. Seven different writers. Seven different writers, um, from Russell Banks to Roman Coppola. Uh, I don't remember the others, but they're you know significant writers. And um, he said, "You have to read these," and I refused. I said, "I'm not reading those." And I said, "I'll read them after I write my first draft and hand it in," which I did. And what was the reasoning behind your decision to do that? I just I didn't want to be influenced either for good or for bad, and I didn't want to second guess myself. Uh, and wonder, geez, am I, am I plagiarizing another writer's work subconsciously? You know, I wanted to, if I was going to make mistakes, I wanted them to be mine, you know, and I wanted to, to own that. Um, and with, with these screenplays, I just didn't want to see, and then finally I did read them. And, you know, it's, you can see from the very first page, you know, why something is working or not working. Was it interesting to see the different approaches different people had taken? You know, that was interesting, you know, um, I mean, one, it uh, starts off with older Jack Kerouac, you know, who's looking back on you know, Another one starts with, with Neil Cassidy on the road, you know, hitch, hitchhiking. Uh, one starts in Times Square, and the, the Sal Paradise character uh, is reciting a poem. So they all have different approaches. And, you know, one thing that Walter said to me, he had read an earlier draft of On the, of on the Road not the one that was published. And the first line references the death of his father. In the On the Road that everyone reads, uh, the, it, it never references that. It references a divorce that mm -hmm. he had. And Walter thought that the death of the father was very interesting. In fact, it tied into the whole idea of this motif of lost fathers, you know, because the Neil Cassidy character is looking for his father. So I begin the screenplay with the death of, of, of Sal's father. And I, I did some research and you know, there's a scene in one of Kerouac's other books where uh, uh, Kerouac's father is lying in bed and uh, there's a, a thing that happened every two weeks, which is his doctor would come and drain liquid from his stomach out of a catheter into a bucket on the floor. And so I wrote a, a scene with that happening. And uh, the Jack Kerouac character is watching this agony and his father is in horrible pain. And his father asks Jack, for a cigarette. And the doctor says, no, that's a really bad idea. And Jack lights a cigarette for him and his father, and they both smoke it while the stuff is being drained from his stomach. And I thought, in, in one scene, you capture you know, his relationship to his father, his rebelliousness. He doesn't listen to the doctor. He smokes a cigarette. I mean, there's so much you know, that happens in, in one page. And uh, so that's how the screenplay opens. And, and Walter really liked that idea, and so I kind of ran with it. When you adapt something on the road, did you go to, did you read the other works by the, by the author just to kind of absorb the vibe? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing I, that I try to do when, when I research something is to sort of live in the world of the, of the subject. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, with this, I probably compiled the biggest beat reference library in the country at this point. You know, I read Burroughs, I read Ginsberg, I read several biographies of Kerouac. I read the Dharma Bums, the Subterraneans, the Town in the City. Um, what was it like, kind of taking that time trip back to that era? It was interesting. You know, it was really, really interesting. I, you know, I love Burroughs. Of, of all of them, I think he's my favorite. Though I love Ginsberg too. In a way, I like Kerouac the least of the of the three. Um, He's sort of like Christopher Isherwood, you know, the, the thing, I am a camera. You know, he was a camera. Mm -hmm. And uh, his nickname as a young kid was Memory Babe, because he would remember everything. And he wrote that way. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was fascinating. It was fascinating to see his evolution, because his first novel was very strongly influenced by Thomas Wolfe, very realistic, very American realism in that tradition. You know, everything's real. Um, and then he started to depart from that, you know, and experiment more. And so by the time, you know, he writes On the Road, uh, he's strongly influenced by jazz. So all, a lot of the writing has a jazzy improvisational feeling where, and, and I think probably better than any other American writer, captures the feeling of jazz as literature better than anyone else. The sound of words is really important in the way the sound of notes are and how things riff and reappear and repeat and you know, it does that endlessly. And so that was, a, that was brand new in American writing at the time. No one, no one was doing that. And what stage are you at with the screenplay for On the Road? What stage is it? Um, well, I've just turned in the second draft. So the second draft has gone to Francis's company, Zoetrope. So they'll, they'll read it and if they're happy, then it'll go on to uh, Focus. And hopefully somewhere, someone will give us a green light. And you think that's a project uh, you were mentioning before where kind of coming at uh, that part of American culture as an outsider is a value? Like looking at it from kind of an outsider's perspective gives you a, a lens that's a little more honest and clearer than... I think so. You know, I feel I do have some objectivity because, you know, of my background and Walter being Brazilian the same way, you know, of really sort of looking at what's there as opposed to what, what we want, you know, what we want out of America to actually look at where, what was America doing in 1948? What did it look like and smell like? And I think the way Ang Lee mm -hmm. captures that, I think Walter will as well. Was there any resistance to your directing when it was, at first, either from yourself or from others? Like, did it, was it a tortured decision or were you ready to commit and just made a decision? Yeah, I, I think I, I probably dragged myself into it, you know, resisted it for a while, but then it felt natural. And, and I have to say, you know, as good as the experience was with Walter, and it was excellent you know, from beginning to end, I did feel, for instance, when we went to Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival, and then we went to Sundance, that at that point in the life of this m movie, it wasn't my movie. It was Walter's movie, especially at Cannes, where they revere the director. And Walter did nothing wrong, but the entire process makes or the writer feel like a second-class citizen. And I did feel, you know, I am the writer of this, but not the author, and I really want to be the author, and I think the only way to do that is to direct. And, um, you know, so f from that point on, it was an easier decision. I think the only resistance I've gotten is, you know, one of the producers will constantly tell me how difficult it is, because I am a first-time director, to get financing, mm -hmm. which I totally understand. Coming from the writing uh, point of view, where it's, you know, it's, it's you and the written word for so long before it's exposed to other people, um, is it a challenge to, to kind of segue into directing where you're at the center of you know, an entire crew of people and you have to verbalize everything to actors and, right. and department heads and technicians? Um, you'll have to ask me in a few months. Okay. <laughs> I don't really know yet. But um, you know, I, I think, as I said earlier, I, I really love actors and I, I can communicate to actors. You know, the question is, will I be able to communicate effectively to my DP and to the sound guy and, and whoever? But I, I think I can. Yeah. Did you direct a, a lot of your plays? I directed some of my plays, yeah. And I also directed a short film last year, a seven-minute film. Um, and then when, when we were making Erie, Indiana, you know, when you're producing a television series... Television is much more of a producer's medium than a director's medium, right? It is. But, you know, as, as a producer, you do function the way a director functions. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at all the casting calls, and I was there as they cut the film. So, you know, I feel I have some familiarity with that. Um, now you'll have authorship of, of your first directorial effort, um, but how have you measured your success in terms of other projects that other people have had their hands on? Like, how do you, what, how, what do you measure your own success by in, in something like Motorcycle Diaries or yeah. the other work? Um, I mean, I think I measure success in, in the sense of, you know, 
am I doing what I want to do? You know, do I have choices? Um, and you know, a, a lot of ways when you when you're doing things because you love them, uh, the business has a funny way of making you earn less money for that. So, but I, I have to say, I haven't. I don't mind taking less money for something I love. You know. And uh, I'm sure my agents at UTA would want to hear that, but you know, they, uh, to their credit, they don't push me to uh, uh, projects that I wouldn't want to do. And you know, as I said once, I think you know, if it if it's meaningful, then um, then I feel I'm successful. Do you think you'll be directing from now on and not and not just writing for anyone? I would love to um, not write for anyone else ever again. <laughs> And just write, you know, write the movies that I want to direct. Will Celestina be the next one up for you? Yeah, Celestina. If all goes well and things are looking very, very good at the moment, you know, we should be starting uh, photography on August eighth. Um, so, you know, we're really hoping we can stick that deadline because that's the that's when Antonio is free, and we really have to follow his schedule. Do you think writers make good directors? Um, I know it's a blanket statement, but yeah, uh, yeah, that's a, yeah. I would say, I would find it hard to believe that a good director doesn't have a writer in them. Interesting. Because a good director must be a good storyteller. And even if you are not a writer by trade, in a way you are writing with the camera. So I think, I think yes. Well, good luck with everything. Thank uh, you. We want to thank today's subject, Jose Rivera, for being with us. Thank you for watching as well. Make sure you check out the other interviews in this uh, series with industry pros. And remember, it all starts with you. The next written by credit could be yours. I'm Mike DeLuca.